Welcome, everybody. We actually have a very needed week for you <laughs> on the Brain Warriors Wave podcast. We have Dr. Stephen Hayes, one of the most cited psychologists in the world. Uh, and we are going to talk about cognitive flexibility. And this. he is the author of, uh, I had it. Um, a liberated mind. A liberated mind and uh, has been involved in something called acceptance and commitment therapy act, which is a popular evidence-based form of psychotherapy that uses mindfulness, acceptance, and value-based methods. Uh, Stephen, welcome. Welcome. Yeah, I'm glad to be here with you. Looking forward to it. So tell us about you and how you got involved in um, creating ACT and thinking about ACT and studying ACT. Well, I came into psychology because I was interested in aspirational goals, and I'm kind of a Maslow person originally. But then I, I really thought Western science ought to be able to do something experimentally to speak to that. And I ended up being a, a behavior therapist. And, but more in the wing of sort of the uh, way I say it is from rats to Walden, too, that you can maybe understand processes that will tell you, you know, how to, you know, relate to your spouse or, or raise your children or organize your business. And then I had the good fortune of developing a panic disorder as a brand new assistant professor. <laughs> and all that kind of crashed into a thing of, uh, you know, can I even talk to five undergraduates without uh you know, having it be to the point where I literally couldn't make sound come out of my mouth. And um, there's a TEDx talk that walks through that, you know, and hitting bottom and really feeling as though I've, you know, I have no way forward, you know, and somehow in that moment of hitting bottom, thinking I'm having a panic attack, a heart attack, but I'm actually having a panic attack at 2.30 in the morning after three years of struggle. I realized that what I was trying to do is run away from myself. Mm. And that old kind of, you're looking at an old hippie, you know, that all those kind of <laughs> Eastern, sitting on hippie, hippie hill, consuming things you probably shouldn't. I mean, just you know, living on a religious commune, Eastern things, all that kind of stuff had way more traction than behavior therapy, CBT, and all the things that I had learned in graduate school. And, and it was instant. I mean, I turned in a five minute, well, probably 20 minute period and stood up off the floor in a different state and went back to my lab the next week and said, we, we've got to study this. And I've spent 40 years trying to hack the human mind to understand how could a successful young professor be spun down to the point where I can't do anything and yet could turn and kind of see a whole nother alternative. And if I could express what it is, instead of trying to get out of my anxiety and run from that, I learned a way to turn and run towards that scary spot, to run in instead of out. And that was transformational. You know, that really kind of just the fog lifted. To run in instead of out. I love that. Is it, is, so um, I wanna hear more about this. And is this, I mean, I'm assuming there's some meditation or meditative component to this, obviously, where you, um, you know, you're able to, well, in, the, in, the, in trying to figure out what are the processes, we spent like 16, 17 years with just invisible. Nobody even knew we were doing it because no hardly anyone was interested. This was before mindfulness was central. I mean, it's before people. I mean, I, you're talking about somebody out of the CBT meeting talking about mindfulness. That's crazy. Uh, and so, and, and I had seen the fights going on. I didn't want to touch that part of mindfulness where monks hit each other over the head with sticks because the <laughs> defining differently. I mean, it, it has a long history of being contentious between different little sex and wings. But what I tried to do is figure out a way to get the space that's inside contemplative practice and link it up to what our wisdom traditions are trying to do in a bottom-up way that you could maybe put on the flat factory floor and two minute exercises, you know, that it, it just didn't seem to me that 10 day silent retreats were going to reach, you know, Joe six pack. It's just not, you know, the educated elite and the, you know, young people, you know, can do that. But 
normal folks, I mean, they need many ways into this more flexible, yeah. open, aware, values-focused space where you can take on your history, show up in the moment, focus on what's important, and get your feet moving. And, it, you know, if you don't do that, you're going to have all kinds of mental health problems. If you do that, you can step up not just to that, the challenges of physical disease, diet, exercise, sport, high performance. And, you know, we're sitting on 415 randomized trials in all of those areas showing the act as a sled of techniques, but really what's more important, psychological flexibility as a focus is transformational in human lives. Mm. So I wrote a, a book, Change Your Brain, Change Your Life, based on the brain imaging work I do. And there's a chapter called Getting Stuck mm. or Getting Unstuck. Yeah. And, and the OCD literature, which is sort of the classic, your stock on something, is associated with hyperfrontality, where their frontal lobes tend to work too hard, which is what sure. we see with uh, the brain spect imaging work we do. And looking at that goes with people who are worried, rigid, inflexible, things don't go their way, they get upset. They also tend to be argumentative and oppositional. And, and if things don't go their way, they get upset, which, you know, now the pandemic and the election and the societal unrest, there's so many people that are stuck. Yeah. And th they found that psychotherapy can actually settle the front part of the brain. So how yeah. exciting is that just because there's a physical manifestation, it doesn't mean medicine. What it means is perhaps a new set of techniques. So I'm really curious about this with kids. So we have a daughter who she borders on OCD. She can be pretty inflexible. So as a child, we used to put flexibility on her chore chart. <laughs> so like it's like yeah. we had to work with her on being flexible because she was very rigid. And yeah, so yeah. then she started to get much better, you know, in her middle school years. The pandemic sent her over the edge. She became extremely panicked, not sure. flexible, frozen, depressed, you know, all of those things. We worked with her on, I'm curious what, what ACT is in com like compared to what we did with her. Sure. Um, so we worked with her on um, a handful of supplements, meditation, yoga, and journaling. And it really did help her get unstuck. So. Sure. So tell me, like with kids, first of all, can it be done with kids? Like, what are you doing? And well, let's have him explain. Yeah. I want to know, like, how does it compare to some of the traditional? Well, that's actually, a, I think it's an awesome kind of hook on the way in. And it's a personal relevance. My, my mom was clinically OCD. I wouldn't leave the house any day as a child without her reminding me not to eat the oleander right outside our door. I mean, this, this, every single time I left the house. And uh, and I have a little bit of it in myself. I've had spaces where I've, I've struggled with the, you know, odd thoughts like, uh, you know, throwing my kids out the window and things like that, especially when the anxiety was really roaring. I think, a lot, of us, I think a lot of us have had that during the pandemic. Yeah, well, that's a little different. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've got four kids ages from the, in the 50s to 15. So I, I've lived that. I understand yeah. that. But no, no, this is different. This is that <laughs> little spinny, scary, oh, my God, what if I did that? Oh, oh uh, I you know, what, what's really happening on it? What's happening is we're taking something that evolved in the last 200,000 to 2.8 million years, symbolic language that you and I are doing right now. That's part of the hack that's underneath hack. We have a whole basic science of cognition of several hundred studies as to what happened to the human species. Because what the bird's out doing outside the window, what you're doing is different. And it's harnessing parts of the brain that are a thousand times older. And so, you know, that rigidity, I think, comes from the way that cognition lays down a particular structure of all the possibilities and then grooves it and grooves it and grooves it, including neurobiologically around the stories of self, the worries that you have about the future, rumination about the past. And if you don't have a little bit of a break on that, it'll go down to all the parts of the brain that are sort of kicking up this almost alligator brainstem level emotional response where you don't even know why you're feeling what you're feeling or being pushed in the way you are, have the urges you have. So I'll give, me, I'll give you a couple of things because there's a lot of work on act with OCD, including with children. We might do something like uh, come down to a core thought and uh, sing it. 
or uh, say it in a, a funny voice. Oh, interesting. Or distill it down to a single word and uh, spell it backwards or uh, say it repeatedly until it loses all meaning. Or so we've developed a, we call them cognitive diffusion, a made up word techniques that allow you to take thought when it comes up like this and is harnessing all those parts of the brain that are flooding in emotion and sort of you're losing your center and, and put your thoughts more like that so that you can notice the process of thinking without being entangled with it. And that's what contemplative practice does. But I think it's kind of cool that we could have little micro, uh, micro things like, I'll give you another one. Um, say it in the third person. Steve's having an odd thought now. Mm. Give your brain a name. George is saying, mm. you know, all of those things take thought that automatically doesn't announce itself as thought. It just is the world structured by thought, but it doesn't announce itself. That's up here and it puts it out there so that you can see you have alternatives and then you can make some choices. Do I really need to engage in that ritual or do I really need to, you know, undo that scary thought or do I have other things that would be more useful to me right now? That's so interesting. So it's almost, um, Part of what you said sounded to me like instead of sort of fighting the thought, which it seems to me like a lot of people do, you're almost emerging yourself in it and dissecting it or looking at it. Um, it's it's a kind of exposure, but in a different way. We're not where, you know, is it gone yet? Is it gone yet? Not that kind of exposure, but the kind that allows you to behave differently in the presence of things that usually command a narrow range of actions that are not going to be helpful to you. Right. And so the rigidity is part of it is the response rigidity. If I can do anything different, anything different in the presence of that thought or that feeling or that bodily sensation or that image, I'm increasing my alternatives to have a choice about what I do in this situation. And that's a, a key element of psychological flexibility. It's one of the six core processes. That's so interesting. So when we come back, we're going to get into some examples of how you can use ACT in your daily life. We are here with Dr. Stephen Hayes, author of Liberated Mind. You can learn more about his work at Stephen with a V, stephenvhayes.com. Stay with us. At Aben Clinics, we're creating a revolution in psychiatry. All other medical specialists look at the organ they treat before they treat it, but most psychiatrists never look and end up guessing based on whatever symptoms you tell them. But how do you know unless you look? Brain SPECT imaging gives us a new way to look at your brain to understand and treat your symptoms so you can ultimately know what is going on and feel better. Welcome back. We are still here with Dr. Stephen Hayes and we are talking about his book, The Liberated Mind and ACT Therapy, which I think is so interesting, Acceptance and Commitment Therapy. Um, so welcome back, Dr. Hayes. So we're going to talk about sort of practical applications of ACT therapy in this session. And you can tell our listeners what they can do to get unstuck from some of their thoughts. Yeah, I was giving some examples in the previous section of sort of uh, little techniques that will help you notice your thoughts in the present. But the, it's not an end in itself. You have to be careful not to think that you're going to distract, diminish. There's no delete button in the nervous system and you're adding to it. It's your sort of brain injury. Uh, oh or, so you're going to carry your history with you. That's the kind of creature we are. And then language increases that. I could ask you right now to think of something that's shameful or painful or betrayal that's happened in your life. And just it flares right in into this conversation just because an old bald guy made sounds. Mm -hmm. And so that's how far away you are from any part of your painful history. And so when you put the mind on a leash with some of these diffusion methods, uh, it isn't to distract or eliminate, it's to give you the flexibility to attract yourself with what's important. 
but you need to take on the emotional piece. So the next thing I would put in the, that practical thing is learning to open up to what your emotions are giving you and especially to get more than centered in the present. And, and they were doing the things that the people listening probably know about these kind of contemplative and mindfulness work. But I think we can do really simple things. I'll give you an example. The follow the breath methods that so many of us use in, right. in doing Vipassana oriented meditation. Here's one that's come out more recently that I really like because you can do it with children and you can do it while you're doing anything. You can even do it while you're talking, which is hard to do when you're following the breath, which is to become aware of the soles of your feet huh. and to yeah. focus just on one foot. And then after a while, focus just on the other foot. And then after a while, focus on both feet. That intervention, Nurbe Singh, who's the editor of the journal Mindfulness, came up with it, an old behavior analyst, actually, somebody that came out of the behavior therapy tradition, has been shown with children, for example, to reduce conflict on the school yard and stuff, or people are, you're dissing me, you know, nah, you know, and getting into fights or quarrels, you know, like 50% reductions with these tiny mindfulness interventions that just encourage you to have your attention under control where you can either shift or stay, broaden or narrow. If you learn to do that, then when the scary thought shows up, you can respectfully decline the invitation of your mind to focus on it, but you're not distracting. Because distracting is like a bad cell phone commercial. Is it gone yet? Is it gone yet? Is it gone yet? Every single time you ask that question, you just created another neurobiological pathway from this moment to that very core. And so instead, move your focus towards what's here and now and what really brings meaning and purpose into your life, which is the next flexibility process that follows. So I when that. I say that again, when a scary thought shows up. We want to well, distract. Well, I'm asking you to also then look for the emotions that show up, the bodily sensations that show up. And then to bring that into present moment focus by working on your attentional skills. I give an example of soles of your feet. Yeah, I love that. You can, and, the, and then bringing that back to difficult emotions or thoughts, use those emotional skills, these kind of metacognitive skills, to notice the thought or notice the feeling, take what's useful, leave the rest but not as a matter of subtraction or elimination. As soon as you're thinking that what you need to do is diminish, subtract, or eliminate, you are inviting this new kid on the block that's only been around a couple hundred thousand to a couple million years. We know that the language trained chimps don't do what your 12 month old baby does that leads to symbolic language. So it's very recent. You're actually sort of fighting it because you're taking that new tool and you're saying, I need to get rid of this. I need to get rid of this. I mean, if I gave you the sense, sense of my life's not going to be open up until I get rid of and right. fill in the blank. And if you find something that's in your psychology, maybe until I get rid of poverty, I get it. Until I get rid of this physical illness, I get it. Until I get rid of this thought. But you just created a pathway to that thought. Right. It's almost like saying, um, don't think of the color blue. Yeah. It's like you just automatically think of the color blue. You're right on the edge of thought suppression, which is just, you know, a horror. And right. yet it seems so logical. Who wouldn't, like, for example, let's say you want to be confident. Who wouldn't want to get rid of thoughts that you're not good enough, feelings that you're not good enough, right? And yet confidence means the word originally, con with, fidence, the same as the word fidelity and the root. In Latin, fides means faith. Mm. So here you're doing the things that is with the least amount of faith you can have. I got to change. I got to eliminate. I got to be different before I can start living. You couldn't get more non-faithful to yourself than that. You're saying, I have to start from where I'm not. Good luck with that. Wow. What would it be like instead if you made that leap of faith and open up to your history that's coming into the present without being entangled with it, without running from it, noticing it, learning, focusing, and doing. And that shift will open up your life. So it's a, 
a complicated set of dance moves, kind of, but it's a very small set. Uh, so you can learn those dance moves. We, you learn how to put together several things in one integrated thing. So I think that's so interesting. Confidence is really the ability to move with faith in yourself. I love that. So I was on CNN last week because of election anxiety. Yeah. And it's so high. Right. And now, you know, hopefully <laughs> the time we release this, we'll know who won. And but yet there's a whole bunch of people who are struggling with anger, acceptance. with frustration, <laughs> sure. with acceptance. How can ACT help them? Well, here's one thing. If you let's just take the the painful part, the acceptance, the, the, the root word of acceptance, that septari part is a Latin word that meant to receive is just to receive a gift. And so I'm not talking about tolerance, resignation, I have to put up with it. It's more like what's still in English where you're giving something precious to someone and you say, here, would you accept this? And you're asking for the person to willingly take the gift. So these are painful gifts. But if we willingly take it in, you know, what does this election teach us about who we are, what our values are, what we're up to, about community, cooperation, connection, perspective taking? Anyone looking at what's going on politically knows that this is not going to be solved by the left or the right winning. No. We have a group problem. We have a we I, problem. And it starts with the me problem. I love that. When we enter into they're not smart enough. Something's wrong with them. Whether you do it from the right or left doesn't matter. Right. Because you start objectifying, dehumanizing. Do you know hate towards others has gone up in yeah. the last 15 years? And it isn't just the recent administration. It's been going on. No. Right. And I think it's because we're living in a modern world where we're just hit with so much diversity that, you know, the tribal primates that we are that grew up with we, meaning just our mates, and they, which is part of why we learned how to speak, I think this is an extension of cooperation, what you and I are doing right now. But, and it allowed us to compete in bands and troops. So there's a lot of folks who think that cooperation came from that. But now the we is all of us. And boy, I mean, take something like COVID. You know, if your neighbor, who may have a different political point of view, gets ill, that's a threat to you. If your neighbor doesn't have health insurance, that's a threat to you. If something's going on in Africa that then will get on the plane and go to Europe and then come to the US, that's a threat to you. And so climate change, immigration, what this is, is the we-ness of the modern world is having to come in and these kind of processes that are ancient, that are about me and our little group in competition have to expand out to where it's all of us. Right. It's become more global. So like, it's yeah. so hard. But coming back to my, the point, I would walk into the pain of this process and then see, is there anything inside the pain of this that we can learn and use mm -hmm. that I can bring into my personal life, into my family, my community, my business, my city, the nation, the world. And I, I'll suggest one, which is how do we cooperate? How do we learn to listen? How can we share? How, what, how can we deal with difference? Mm. And, you know, when you're in a world where the person next to you might be, you know, on a prayer rug and you, you've never seen anybody on a prayer rug or the person next to you is a different ethnic group and you didn't grow up that way, or you're seeing on things on the television that are completely foreign to you, you better figure out a way to be able to take perspective or you retreat into this kind of, uh, you know, hold them off, keep them off kind of posture, which will be bad for your heart, bad for your health and bad for the world. That's so interesting. I like that. You know, I think one of the reasons we're so divided is fear drives clicks and clicks drive revenue. So well, and we you touched just on finished, social media. I mean, social media. We has just changed finished everything. watching the social dilemma. Yeah, and it's just horrifying how artificial intelligence is manipulating our minds for money. And um, so, well, if they can drive us into the little clicks and sell things to us, and sometimes on the basis of uh, despising, disconnect, and fear. 
Right. Right. Fear. So it, that, that process you just talked about, there's also an avenue back to fear. There's more fear. Right. I think the whole nation is living inside fear right now. Right. It's, it's all fear-based. Fear I mean, it's honestly, we hear it all the time. It's fear-based. It's yeah. fear-based. All right. So when we come back, I'd really love to talk about how people can use ACT for specific anxiety issues. And then maybe in the last one, we'll do it with depression. Uh, awesome. Because with all the studies, I'm sure you have thoughts and yeah. techniques. We're here with Dr. Stephen Hayes, author of A Liberated Mind. You can learn more about him at his website, Stephen with V Hayes.com. Stay with us. Welcome back, everyone. We're really having a good time learning some very important so tips for how you can master your mind. So important. Uh, we're here with Dr. Stephen Hayes, author of A Liberated Mind, a professor of psychology, a teacher. He and I both teach together at the Evolution of Psychotherapy Conference coming up in December. It's going to be a virtual conference given what's happening with the world so you don't even have to get in your car and drive to Anaheim you can get Stephen's wisdom uh virtually uh evolution of psychotherapy you can I'm actually I don't know how many lectures you're doing Stephen I'm doing six yeah um, about that range too much crazy craziness <laughs> um and we've been talking about act acceptance, love that word, and commitment therapy. So let's talk about it for people who have anxiety disorders, sure. whether it's generalized mm -hmm. anxiety or panic disorders where you started. Yeah. Which, uh, give us, if you could, some examples uh, of maybe people you've worked with and then the process of getting well? Well, the previous segments walk through some of the parts that are more over on the acceptance and mindfulness side. And so they probably feel a little familiar. We haven't talked too much about connecting with a sense of self that watches and observes all of it. And I really want that because it looks to you and you buy into this narrative self story, which takes over parts of the mind in such a way we're seeing it in the psychedelic therapy that we're doing. ACT is used very often in psychedelic therapy that it starts opening up sensory motor channels that have been inhibited by the narrative sense of self so that you literally don't contact things that don't fit your self story. It's harnessing parts of the brain that are ancient, that are with these new tools. But so we want a sense of self there that is more spiritual, I might say, uh, less defined by form and more by pure awareness. The kind that is there that starts in this journey we're on when your mama looks in your eyes and says, oh, you sweet baby, and you dump uh, natural opiates in your brain just at the process of being seen. Because we're such social primates, it's critical. And by the way, mama's brain is doing the same thing. And the only other creature that does it is dogs, and we've been co-evolving for a pretty long time. So. We're connected in consciousness and we want to open up to that part. And so we try to do things that separate the content from the observer, the noticer, the witness, the, the I hear nowness. Uh, so that when you have anxiety, when you have your body doing what you're doing, you have your mind telling you have to run, you have to fight, you have to hide, you can notice that and have a little bit of separation that's not dissociative but more perspective taking. You can see it happening, learn from it, find out what's inside it. So that's one thing I, I would do that I need to take the next step uh, to what's inside your anxiety struggles. And I'll, I'll give you a practical example of that. But yeah. That's so nothing. interesting. Um, as a child, I grew up with a lot of chaos and I just actually wrote a book about it. Um, it's called The Relentless Courage of a Scared Child. And it's really about overcoming you know, trauma, chaos, you know, grief, that kind of stuff in your, in your earlier years. One of the things someone taught me, and I don't, I don't even remember who taught me this when I was going through something really hard, but it sounds a little like what you're describing and it really helped me. So I 
finally learned how to settle my monkey mind by, you know, learning how to meditate, which was not an easy thing for me. But someone taught me that if I could elevate, like imagine myself elevating out of the scenario and look at it from a 30,000 foot view yes. and watch it or watch it like a movie, yes. but not be in the movie. And then yeah. what would the characters do? Like, what would you have them do? What are they doing? Exactly. How does it work out? It was mind blowing to me. It was such a simple thing, but I was like, wow. Like it just, it really helped me. Well, Is that it, kind of what we're talking about? Yeah, absolutely. It's powerful in the model. There's a number of techniques in, in the act work and it's even in the basic science. I think I can explain a little bit in terms of our theory of cognition and the actual work that's being done. Dozens of studies that make sense of what you just said. And by the way, I had the same experience. You know, what I found inside my panic as I moved through was a scared kid under the bed listening to my parents fight. But my right. dad is an alcoholic. My mom kind right. of depressed OCD and with domestic violence. And I was afraid he was going to hit her. And, and sometimes that happened or, or threats of it, very strong threats of it. So, uh, you know, it activated very primitive programming because my first panic attack happened in a in a psychology department meeting where I say full professors were fighting in the way that only wild animals and full professors are capable of. <laughs> Which is why I, I did not know where, where that emotional arousal came from because I had suppressed that memory so much that I didn't have easy access to it. I could have said, now my parents fought, but I didn't know that it. So if we, if we, Take this part, this witnessing self, what you just said, and the example you use of perspective taking. Here's this makes tools very simple if you understand the cognitive basis of it. There's three uh, relations that are learned in young children. I, you, here, there, now, then. Mm. They're learned in that order. When they come together as I, here, now, mm. you're able to extend consciousness verbally to you, there, then. We could imagine what it's right, like right now to be in the wildfires in a particular right. state or starving or in a war zone in another part of the world. What's going to happen with in the future with our children? Or So when you shift time, place, or person in terms of perspective taking, you're tapping into what your contemplative practice is giving you of, you know, as if you're doing follow the breath, for example, your attention takes it away, you catch the puppy moves. You connect with this I hear nowness and you bring it back. There's a part of your mind that isn't on autopilot, that isn't programmed in that way. It's just here now. And you keep touching that part and then bring your attention back to the present. Well, if I asked you, for example, go back to the question that Nietzsche asked, you know, what, you know, what to do about an anxiety kind of thing. Let's take, I'll take my anxiety, which has to do with social anxiety and panic. What I'm going to want to do is catch this witnessing self and look with a sense of self-compassion, self-kindness, acceptance in the sense of receiving the gift of what my mind and body is doing. As I do that, I open myself up to the history. I tell the story in one of my TEDx talks of actually finding the little boy under the bed who I didn't know was there at eight years old crying and saying something, I'm going to do something. Mm. And then realizing there was nothing safe to do and backing up and just holding himself and crying more. I'm a grown up now. I'm a psychologist. I can do something. No, I couldn't solve my parents' problems, but I can walk into the hell of other people's history and help them solve theirs. Mm -hmm. And so part of the, of the shift here is inside your anxiety struggles, inside your self-criticism, is a deep yearning for something that is values-based, which if you get this more transcendent sense of self in the room, you're not threatened by your history, and so you can learn from it. I didn't find this out about the values underneath my panic disorder till three years into ACT. I had to sort of tell, really convince my mind that it's okay to be me, not by argument, by experience. And then it started opening up the doors to my history and I found things out. And what I found in there was that why I'm a psychologist, I found meaning and purpose. I've never met a social anxiety person who doesn't want to be with people. Right. Have you? I've no. never met a depressed person who doesn't want to know how to feel. Right. And participate and be part of it. 
You know, so underneath our pain is our purpose. Right. You flip you it talk, over. Talk about pain to purpose. Yeah. And yeah. The, I actually called, titled my first TEDx that, uh, that I said, how to turn pain into purpose, because oh. that was what happened to me in my panic struggle. Interesting. And, Fascinating. So, and I would want to do that with anxiety person. I would, you know, use this kind of witnessing self, this acceptance and diffusion techniques, then go into the panic, but not as an end result with a secret message of when you diminish it enough, you can live. No, more like this is a passenger that will come along with you in your journey and that has important things to tell you. Mm, I love that. Like, for example, that uh, suffering matters mm. in my own history. Yeah. And you really want to do something about it. Well, that gets me up in the morning. Yeah. I love that. All right. When we come back, we're going to have one more session. Uh, I think we're getting our own therapy. I know. Yeah. I have so many questions. This is so great. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to talk about ACT and depression, which has tripled since uh, yeah. the pandemic started. It's just horrifying. Uh, we're here with Dr. Stephen Hayes, author of A Liberated Mind, professor of psychology. You can learn more about ACT either by getting a copy of A Liberated Mind or going to Stephen's website, Stephen with a V, chayes.com. Stay with us. Welcome back. We are still here with Dr. Stephen Hayes, and we are just having such a great time um, talking about ACT therapy and um, just really how to free your mind. And I love this. And in our last episode, Dr. Hayes, we talked about being able to witness the self. And I was telling you about something that happened to me as a child. I'm just going to really quickly throw this out there. Um, I went through a severe depression in my early 20s, didn't want to live. And I told you someone had taught me this technique of being able to witness it from a distance and figure out what to do. And it was so powerful. It was so helpful. One thing that I learned, and I don't know if this means I have like split personality or what it means, but <laughs> I learned, I, learned um, I figured this out on my own and I don't know if this is a technique or not, but I'm just curious what your thoughts are. There were times I didn't know what to do. I didn't have the answer. And I started like thinking to myself, well, I'm removed from the situation. And if I were watching TV, there would be people I could ask. And I started asking people that I trusted. Yeah. I know that sounds really crazy. But it, um, I know you're looking at me. See, only psychiatrists look at you with that look. He's doing it right now. He's psychoanalyzing me. Um, but it was, I found it helpful. I started imagining people that I thought were the smartest people on the planet and what would they say? Yeah. And it just, it started to open my mind to possibilities. Exactly. What shows you have wisdom within. You actually have some answers to this, but you're grooving a particular mode of mind that doesn't give you easy access to it. When you touch the perspective taking sense of self by changing time, place, or person, so you could go to the future. If you were to have your life evolve in a positive way, imagine yourself going to the future, looking back at this very moment right now, what might you want to say to yourself? I almost okay. guarantee you it's going to say something that's actually more useful, more values-based, more helpful than what the, the monkey mind is going to give you. I love that. You could do it in the in the form of a person. Can you think of it? Anybody who's powerfully lifted you up, who's been there for you, whom you would like pick as a guide for a moment like this. Yeah. Take a little time to picture his or her face. Go behind those eyes. Have them look back at you. What do they see in you right now? And love if they it. were to say something to that person called you, what would they say? So you can, in little micro techniques, do it exactly what you did. This pick a guide pick is actually in the act canon. Oh, interesting. The techniques that are in use. So we will happily uh, make the connection because we're fellow travelers. What you're doing is really resonant to what the entire science underneath the act of psychological flexibility says. But often what will come out, and I've done this with people, you know, in inpatient facilities who are just have lost everything. They're at the edge of the rope. And the wisest things come out. And what they often 
what the what the theme will be. It's okay to be you. You can open up to your history. You can do this, and that values matter. There's you're here to do something. What you really yearn for is legitimate. Your deepest yearnings are legitimate. You're not broken. You're just stuck. You're in a cul-de-sac. You know, have faith in yourself. And these things that are almost like truisms start showing up. You know, love makes the world go round. Or one of my mo- two that come to mind is my, with my mom, who she would always say, "Keep it in balance, dear. Keep it in balance." <laughs> and another one she'd say is, "Be yourself. Just be yourself." And wow, you know, when I'm really stuck and struggling and, you know, is that wise? Yes, it's wise. So we're carrying wisdom within. It's some of its ancient wisdom. It's in our cultural traditions, but it's dominated by cultural forces and folks trying to sell us uh, products. And if they can make us miserable enough, they will. And right. on, on it goes. And it just. Right. So, so I, I missed two things within. as I'm trying to write. At the same time, it's writing what I you're just saying. love so much. <laughs> so the first thing I heard was, "It's okay to be you." Yeah. And do you remember what you said after that? There were four things. <laughs> not the fourth. Oh, oh, values. Oh, yeah, oh, that, not that okay to you? What, that are, you, what are you here for? And yeah. you know, in our work, we always think about four big circles to understand people. So, what's your biology? And that's why we look at people's brains because how the heck do I know unless I look? Um, What's the psychology? How do you think? What was your development like? The social circle, who do you hang out with? Because they're contagious. But what most psychologists and psychiatrists never talk to their patients about is your spiritual self, Mm -hmm. which is, it's not just your connection to God. It's why do you care? What is your sense of meaning and purpose? And you can have the three other circles right, but be terribly depressed because you don't have a sense of connection to why you're here. Yeah, that spiritual sense of self empowers connecting, I think, with meaning and purpose and building behavioral habits around that. In part, because I, I use the metaphor of it, it's kind of like a hinge of a windshield wiper. Mm. In the ACT model, on the left, you've got acceptance and diffusion we've talked about. In the center, we've got contact with the now from the spiritual point of view. And on the right, we've got values and committed action. Those mm. are the six, okay? If you imagine them from left to right like a windshield wiper, and things are happening. Yes, is happening. Right. And the stuff is getting kicked up on the, the like a, driving a car, on the windshield in front of you. This windshield of the spiritual sense of self, this anchor of this, the I hear now this awareness allows you to open up to the difficulties of your own history and the chatter your mind's given you. And then to take it on board and come into the present moment in a way that's flexible, fluid, and voluntary, and then carry your consciousness over to what brings meaning and purpose to you. What are you about? What are the qualities of being and doing that you want to show, you want to instantiate, you want to reveal in this next moment? Mm. And then, okay, what would you have to do in the world of behavior and actual actions and choices, situational changes that would manifest that quality? If you've connected with the importance of love, what would be a loving thing to do? If you, if you connect with the, the importance of cooperation, how could you, if you connect with the person of genuineness, are there some things you need to clean up now about places where you've uh, hid and and lied and went into pretense with friends or people who you really you can trust with being more genuinely you. You know, and, and you go into de- the depression example you're trying to give. That arc, you know, includes opening up to painful kind of dark emotions and thoughts, but then coming into the present and connecting with values. And, you know, you look at some of the things that move depression powerfully. It includes things like behavioral activation that is linked to being in the now, nature walks, things like that, friends, but also in the service of something bigger than yourself. And I ask you this to think about the number of people that have come into you depressed who have cut themselves off from their friends, from the charitable work they do, 
from the compassionate things they do for others, and they've turned their consciousness inward. If you can help a person turn their consciousness outward and take that meaningful step, I haven't met many people who are, you know, really on a values-based journey where depression wraps them around an, ax an axle. Yes, it shows up, but it tends to be transient. Why? Because we're doing meaningful things. Mm -hmm. You know your life matters because you were there for that child or you raised that money or you helped in that uh, thing that really moves you or you were there at the ASPCA and you saw that uh, you know, wounded animal's eyes and knew that it mattered that you were there. So life is a depression drug if you can connect into meaning and purpose. Mm, I like that. That's great. Life, Life is a depression is drug. A depression if you drug. Can, if you, you connect, depends on who you're living with. If you, he said, if you connect, <laughs> meaning and purpose. If you connect you to meaning and purpose, you are my antidepressant. <laughs> it's so true. You, you've just been so wonderful, Stephen. So great. Thank you so much for sharing with our audience. I know a lot of people will want to learn more. Stephen is the author of Liberated Mind. Stephen C. Hayes. Stephen with the V dot com. You can learn more. Um, now I'm sad we're not going to be in person at the Evolution of Psychotherapy. I know. Uh, yeah, I've enjoyed this so much. Be a hoot to be able to actually be in your presence physically, but post COVID, we'll find a way. Yeah. No. We'll. I'm looking forward to it uh, very much. So we thank you for so your fantastic. time and. Uh, I'm looking forward to learning more about it and sharing it uh, with people at Amen Clinics uh, and uh, our audience as well. So thanks for being with us. Thanks, Dr. Hayes. It was wonderful. Thank you. All right. You're listening to the Brain Warriors Way podcast. I know you learned something. Uh, write it down. Take a picture of it. Post it on any of your social media sites. Uh, go to brainwarriorswaypodcast.com, leave us a comment, question, or review. If you're enjoying the Brain Warriors Way podcast, please don't forget to subscribe so you'll always know when there's a new episode. And while you're at it, feel free to give us a review or five-star rating as that helps others find the podcast. If you're considering coming to Amen Clinics or trying some of the Brain Healthy supplements from BrainMD, you can use the code PODCAST10 to get a 10% discount on a full evaluation at amenclinics.com or a 10% discount on all supplements at brainmdhealth.com. For more information, give us a call at 855-978-1363.